game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. Watch the latest Ram Dass documentary film, Becoming Nobody, on Gaia.com. Of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder. The Gaia.com library supports you with transformational content. See it for yourself and go to Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and check out the Be Here Now playlist curated just for you. Visit Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and start your free trial today. Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. So please let yourself sit comfortably and at ease. The teachings are most importantly meant to be a reminder. There's no quiz at the end. You don't get graded. Um, If you hear something that resonates, that feels true in your own deep experience, then let that be a reminder of something important to you. If something seems wrong, you can question it or just throw it out. Um, But in a way, to listen is its own kind of meditation of being present and noticing what is evoked or what feels um, resonant to you and what may not, um, and what's helpful. In the past months, I've done a series of talks based on stories. There was a long story about the last year of the Buddha's life and a long story about... um, Sir Gawain, part of um, King Arthur's court. There was a long Hindu myth about Nachiketa and the Lord of Death, a number of different stories. And I'd like to continue in that spirit tonight and maybe again as we go on. Barry Lopez, wonderful writer, has a book that he wrote entitled, uh, he wrote wrote a lot about the North and um, the Yukon, Alaska and so forth. Uh, The title of the book is Sometimes You Need a Story More Than Food. And it really speaks to something um, so important. I know in being part of retreats with vets who came back from Iraq and Afghanistan and so forth, that the retreats that we held were a place often the first time they felt safe enough to tell their story because a lot of the things that happened when they were there are not the kind of thing you can tell your family or your friends. And so they carry it as a kind of weight on the soul. There's some way in which they'll say, well, I can't tell you what I saw. And then it goes on to something even more difficult. I can't tell you what I had to do. And when you get combat vets and you can make a safe and protected space and say, here's the place you can tell the stories that have burdened your heart and hear those of others, it's a remarkable healing. And in the same way, my beloved wife, Trudy, who runs Inside LA, um, the center in Santa Monica, has had a program for almost 15 years that started with the um, healers, the nurses and physicians from the NICU and the PICU, the neonatal um, and um, the pediatric intensive care unit in Children's Hospital. And then it grew to other hospitals. And the same thing happened. They would have a retreat and make this beautiful place. And the nurses would come. And in the intensive neonatal intensive care, regularly babies die. And you have to tell parents, I'm sorry, your child died. And, you know, that's an occurrence that happens every week, you know, and then you have to clear out the incubator and get ready for the next baby. And you can't go home and talk about that to people. And so, again, light the candle and make a sacred space and talk about what it means to hold this life in compassion. And then invite people 
to tell the stories that they need to for the healing of their own heart. So that's why sometimes you need a story more than food. You understand. Sometimes to hear it and sometimes to tell it. Looking out as we do at the human realm, which is um, a mixed bag, you may have noticed. (laughs) You're one of them, so you know, right? And seeing, along with a million acts of goodness that take place every, you know, afternoon, um, the divisiveness and the continuing racism and conflict and war and so forth, and made visible in all these different ways, some of which has always been here and um, some in new forms, the kind of modern terrorism that we saw in Sri Lanka this week or that we saw the synagogue in Southern California and so forth. Um, I want to talk some about conflict in a way through some stories. Um, there was a... Uh, an organization that was started in Palo Alto decades ago. Um, Joan Bias, who was was a friend, was, I think, one of the founders of it. And it was called A Better Game Than War. Because we will have conflict. We have different desires and needs and styles and so forth. But how do we do this as humanity? How do we deal with conflict with one another? And I'm part also of supporting um, an organization called the Nonviolent Peace Force that sends unarmed civilians who are really well trained into conflict areas in Sudan, in Syria, in Philippines, and other places. And mostly what they do is sit down and talk to the people on different sides and then do unarmed accompaniment. Um, And they're able, in doing so, to, to hear what people are really afraid of and what they really need and kind of broker some possibilities for civility even in the midst of difference and conflict. So um, let me start with a story. I'm going to read this one. The other two I'll tell. Um, But I'm going to read it partly also because the language is very well written. And um, you may have heard one or two of these stories in years past if you're a regular at Spirit Rock. But their stories, it's sort of like, oh, bedtime. Would you tell, read that one again, Daddy? You know, <clears throat> seriously, you know, a really good story um, uh, is something to mine, to, um, you know, to inhabit and so forth. And this is a story by a friend of mine who has um, died some years ago named Terry Dobson, who was a very... Um, accomplished martial artist who'd trained in many different disciplines in Japan. Um, And I work with him in the men's movement with Robert Bly and Michael Mead and Luis Rodriguez and so forth. Um, He was a great big bear of a man who uh, was also became a really wise and remarkable teacher. Um, So this is his story. The train clanked and rattled through the suburbs of Tokyo on a drowsy spring afternoon. How many people know this story? Just a handful. Okay, cool. Our car was comparatively empty. A few housewives with their kids in tow, some old folks going shopping. I gazed absently at the drab houses and dusty hedgerows. At one station, the door opened, and suddenly the afternoon quiet was shattered by a man bellowing violent, incomprehensible curses. The man staggered into our car. He wore laborer's clothing, and he was big, drunk, and dirty. Screaming, he swung at a woman holding a baby who was in his way. The blow sent her spinning into the laps of an elderly couple. It was a miracle the baby was unhurt. Terrified, the couple jumped up and scrambled toward the end of the car. The laborer aimed a kick at the retreating back of the old woman, but missed as she scuttled to safety. This so enraged the drunk, he grabbed the metal pole in the center of the car and tried to wrench it out of his stanchion. I could see his hands were bleeding. The passengers were frozen with peer, and I stood up. I was young then, some 20 years ago, and in pretty good shape. I'd been putting in a solid eight hours of Aikido training nearly every day for the past three years. I liked to throw and grapple. I thought I was tough. 
trouble was my martial skill was untested in actual combat. (laughs) As students of Aikido, we were not allowed to fight. Aikido, my teacher said, is the art of reconciliation. Whoever has the mind to fight has broken his connection with the universe and is already defeated. I listened to his words. I tried hard. I even went so far as to cross the street to avoid the pinball punks who lounged around the train stations. My forbearance exalted me. I felt both tough and holy. In my heart, however, I wanted an absolutely legitimate opportunity whereby I might save the innocent by destroying the guilty. (laughs) This is it, I said to myself. People are in danger. If I don't, don't do something, they will get hurt. Seeing me stand up, the drunk recognized a chance to focus his rage. Ah, he roared, a foreigner. You need a lesson in Japanese manners. I held on lightly the commuter strap overhead and gave him a slow look of disgust and dismissal. I planned to take this turkey apart, but he had to make the first move. I wanted him mad, so I pursed my lips and blew him an insolent kiss. (laughs) All right, he hollered, you're going to get a lesson. He gathered himself to rush at me. A split second before he could move, someone shouted, Hey! Hey! It was ear-splitting. I remember the strange, joyous, lilting quality of it, as though you and a friend had been searching diligently for something, and he suddenly stumbled upon it. Hey! I wheeled to my left. The drunk spun to his right. We both stared down at a little old Japanese man. He must have been well into his 70s, this tiny gentleman sitting there immaculate in his kimono. He took no notice of me, but beamed delightedly at the laborer as though he had the most important, most welcome secret to share. Come here, the old man said in an easy vernacular, beckoning to the drunk. Come here, talk with me, he waved his hand lightly. The big man followed as if on a string. He planted his feet belligerently in front of the old gentleman and roared above the clacking wheels, Why the hell should I talk to you? The drunk now had his back to me. If his elbow moved a millimeter, I'd drop him in his socks. (laughs) The old man continued to beam at the laborer. What you been drinking, he asked, his eyes sparkling with interest. I've been drinking sake, the laborer bellowed, and it's none of your business. Flecks of spittle spattered the old man. Oh, that's wonderful, the old man said. Absolutely wonderful. You see, I love sake, too. Every night, me and my wife, she's 76, you know, we warm up a little bottle of sake and take it out in the garden, and we sit on an old wooden bench, and we watch the sun go down, and we look to see how our persimmon tree is doing. My great-grandfather planted that tree, and we worry about whether it will recover from the ice storms we had last winter. Our tree has done better than I expected, though, especially when you consider the poor quality of the soil. It's gratifying to watch when we take our sake and go out to enjoy the evening, even when it rains. And he looked up at the laborer, eyes twinkling. As he struggled to follow the old man's conversation, the drunk's face began to soften. His fist slowly unclenched. Yeah, he said, I I love persimmons, too, his voice trailed (laughs) off. Yes, said the old man, smiling, and I'm sure you have a wonderful wife. No, replied the laborer, my wife died. And very gently, sweeping with the motion of the train, the big man began to sob. I don't got no wife. I don't got no home. I don't got no job. I'm so ashamed of myself. And tears rolled down his cheeks. A spasm of despair ripped through his body. Now it was my turn. Standing there in my well-scrubbed youthful innocence, my make-this-world-safe-for-democracy righteousness, I suddenly felt dirtier than he was. And then the train arrived at my stop. As the door opened, I heard the old man cluck sympathetically. My, my, he said, that's such a difficult predicament. Sit down here. Tell me about it. And I turned my head for one last look. And the laborer was sprawled on the seat, his head in the old man's lap. And the old man was softly stroking the filthy, matted hair. And as the train pulled away, I sat down on a bench. What I had wanted to do with muscle had been accomplished with kind words. I had just seen Aikido tried in combat. And the essence of it was love. 
I would have to practice the art a long time with an entirely different spirit. It would be years before I could speak about the resolution of conflict. Now, one of the things that's important when you listen to a story is to feel where you are in that story. You know, because you could be in any place. You could be the woman with the child who is protecting their child and worried. You could be Terry, Mr. Macho, you know. You could be the guy who has um, so much loneliness and loss, the drunk who doesn't have a family and doesn't know how to manage. You could be the other passengers. And maybe you could be all of them at different times. But it's also kind of interesting to sense what piece of that resonance, if you were to place yourself in the story right now, where would you be? Who would you be if there was a place for you? Because the stories are kind of like storehouses. They have a kind of intelligence in them, a good story. Um, that touches not just one channel, but our heart and our memory and our emotions and our way of seeing and thinking. What do you learn from the story? You know, what does it remind you of? Not just in this nice sitting together where people are behaving themselves tonight pretty well, which is a nice part of my job. I generally am with people on their good behavior. (laughs) But you know how it is with the other people around you, right? And maybe even occasionally yourself, that um, some other elements of the story might be at play. And how are you approaching that? What is your spirit? That becomes part of the reflection. Um, I came back a few weeks ago from spending time with Ram Dass. Trudy and I went there to be with him. For those of you who know him, the author of Be Here Now, and this very wonderful spiritual teacher who's also a fountain of love, really quite extraordinary. He was pretty sick when we were there, and he was in the hospital and almost died, actually. And we were there with him a lot in the hospital, and then he got better. Hallelujah, he's much better. Um, But he almost died, and he said, then I changed my mind, and he came back. (laughs) You know, he's very, very funny and witty. But in his house, he has a great big altar, you know, as big as the whole front row here. And there's pictures of his guru, Neem Karoli Baba, and of great saints. There's Mother Teresa, and there's Ramakrishna, and there's statues of Buddha, and, you know, Shiva and Ram, and all the kind of Hindu deities. But there's also, you know, pictures of, great Hasidic rabbis and, you know, Mother Mary and Bodhisattva Kuan Yin and and, 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 and other people that he admires. And it's this wonderful, huge altar. Um, and always somewhere in the middle. For a while, it was Dick Cheney had a big place on the altar. <laughs> now it's our current um, administration is holding that place of honor with a big smile. Um, and... Um, he said, yeah, this is, this is my practice. This is my practice to take inspiration and to try to hold the entire world in my heart and love, all of it, with all its joys and sorrows and so forth. Um, but it's not just him, you know, it's me and you. And there's an article that I read um, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who is one of the great public phys- figure physicians, on, he's the CNN doctor on call, basically, who comments on various things. You know, he went from Harvard to CNN. I don't know whether that's up or down, but whatever it is. <laughs> anyway, and um, he's... Uh, so this is an article about lessons from meditating with the Dalai Lama because he went to Dharamsala to be with the Dalai Lama. And in his search for what to put on the air in his shows that would be helpful, he thought, well, he'll get the Dalai Lama to help him to meditate, which happened. 
He said, so he went there, and it was early morning. They arranged for him to go meditate with the Dalai Lama. So he had to go early in the morning, and then they said, all right, well, here's the protocol. You go in, and when you do, you make a bow, and he'll be sitting. It's in his meditation, but we've set up a place for you to sit. Go sit quietly, and you can sit with him, and, you know, maybe afterward you can talk about it or something. Okay, how cool is that? Let's go sit with the Dalai Lama, right? So he did that, and he said, I was nervous, and it felt like, oh... But the Dalai, and they said, you've talked to him, your holiness, the Dalai Lama doesn't like that holiness stuff. He's just like, come on in, you know. But anyway, there he was in this little modest room in the Dalai Lama's house. Um, and he sat down cross-legged. And um, he said, all my meditation and insecurities began to kick in. And a few minutes passed, I was trying to meditate. And after about 10 minutes, I heard his deep, distinctive voice say, hmm. Any questions? <laughs> and I looked up and saw the Dalai Lama's smiling face starting to break into his characteristic head-bobbing laugh. This is hard for me, I said. This is Sanjay Gupta. Me too, he exclaimed. <laughs> After doing daily for 60 years, still hard. This was at once surprising and reassuring to hear him say this. The Dalai Lama, the great Buddhist monk and spiritual leader, also has trouble meditating. And then he gave him some instructions. So I read that and I thought, okay, I mean, I have my trouble, but what kind of trouble would the Dalai Lama have? <laughs> he, the guy does know how to meditate. I mean, I sat with him, we've talked about meditation. Um... This is not a, a non sequitur. It, it threads back to what I was just talking about, and you'll, you'll hear how. He doesn't have the altar like Ram Dass, but he has the Chinese Communist military um, installed in a lot of the biggest temples in Tibet where he's un, not allowed to go back. He has a number of his um, really highly respected um, monks and leaders in prisons who have been tortured. He has concern for the Tibetan culture, people. Plus, as a world figure, people come in from all over and say, can you help in Sudan? Can you help in, you know, Palestine and Israel and so forth? So when I imagine his difficulty, I don't think it's like I'm having trouble finding my breath. I think it's the difficulty, like that big altar, to say, what do I do Whoever, and I'm not saying what your political persuasion is, you have your own, each of you have your own politics, bless you. Whatever I can say, it's tough. But anyway, whoever you'd put in the middle of your altar as somebody that you had to come to terms with, he has plenty of them. He calls them my friend, the enemy sometimes, you know. Um, so I think that's what he meant. You understand what I'm saying? That this is a common human predicament that we all have. How do we hold the conflicts and how do we even hold that which is causing suffering? Here's a verse from the Dhammapada of the Buddha. Look how he abused me. I think it's good often I try to change the pronouns to make them more universal, but this one's right in its way. Look how he abused me and beat me, how he threw me down and robbed me. Continue to live with such thoughts and you live in hate. Look how he abused me and beat me, how he threw me down and robbed me. Abandon these thoughts and live in love. In this world, hatred never ends by hatred, but by love alone is healed. This is the ancient and eternal law. And so here again, it's not the Buddha saying, you know, put a smiley face on it because everything's fine. Um, really bad and painful and difficult things happen to us and in this world. Um, and one needs to try to work to protect people and do what's possible and protect yourself and all that. But even so, um, life has pleasure and pain and gain and loss and um, joy and sorrow. Anybody not have that? <laughs> Just kind of checking in here. Okay, you can have your whatever it was, $10 or something back. Or you. Um but how do you hold this? And how do you hold the conflict that's within you? Because it is in there as well. How do you hold the conflict that's around us in this world? How do you touch it? And there's Terry Dobson, 
big bear of a guy ready to take this guy apart, learning a lesson that the world needs to learn, really. Because it's quite clear that no, I mean, we're the nation that sells more weapons than any other nation on earth. We have billions of dollars of killing machines and we don't feel safe. Hmm, something maybe not right in this equation, you know. Um, how do we do this? And how do we embody it in the modern era? Yes, we have our techno, techno connections, all the ways we can, you know, Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook and email and all the things that can... But as, as we know, they are all, that's also a very thin connection. It doesn't really have much depth or, or generally very much emotion to it. Um, and so there is at the same time rising loneliness and isolation and lack of meaning. And what gives us meaning becomes part of this question in conflict, you know. And part of what gives us meaning, um, well, my friend Amale Doma Somme, West African medicine man and shaman, says in the Dagara people, his people, that every child is born with a special cargo. And I love this metaphor. Cargo is what's carried up the West African rivers on the cargo boats. So it's been that way for thousands of years. And the goal of every child and every human being is to deliver the gifts that we're giving to them, to deliver their cargo into the world. And if you can't deliver your gifts, what you have to offer, then it will be a painful life for you. So you have to know what your cargo is and you have to find your way to offer that to the world and to trust that it's possible. As poet Dina Metzger writes, activist and wonderful poet, she says, give me everything mangled and bruised and I will make a light of it to make you weep and we will have rain and we will begin again. And she speaks about the capacity to take even conflict and difficulty And in the long run to see that you can sow seeds that bring people back together again and that create some sense of peace and harmony. And I've talked about this before, but in the Colombian um, Civil War that happened in Colombia for 50 years until a couple of years ago when it was more or less resolved, one of the steps that was taken to resolve that conflict the government got some helicopters and filled them with photographs and went to the areas of the jungle where the FARC, the revolutionaries, had been living for decades. And they dropped photographs of their families, of their old mothers and fathers, of their sisters and brothers grown up, of nieces and nephews they'd never seen. They dropped them into the forest with the names and so so that the people who'd been away as fighters for 10 or 15 or 20 years could remember that they were connected to something bigger and something that had love in it. You understand? So meaning and connection. And that is, in some way, the theme of the next story. Hmm. And this is a story I'll mostly tell, although I'll read a little bit of it. And it's a story that Thich Nhat Hanh uses. Um, It actually comes from Tolstoy. And where Tolstoy got it, it's it's an ancient story. But Tolstoy made made it sing as, you know, a magician like Tolstoy can do. One day it occurred to a certain empress that if she only knew the answer to three questions... She would never stray in any matter. What is the best time to do each thing? Who are the most important people to work with? And what is the most important thing to be doing at all times? So the empress issued a decree through the land saying she wanted answers to these questions and those who knew the answer should come to her palace. And in reply to the first question, of course, All kinds of people flooded in. They sent emails and they texted and they, you know, 
Some even came in person. And one said for the first question, you know, which was um, the best time to do any do things, said, well, you should make a really good cal- Google Calendar. You should get everything on, you know, on your calendar and set aside time for all the things that matter. And another said, no, you can't really plan because life is too unexpected and you just have to set aside your amusements and be really present for whatever is calling your attention as the empress. And someone else said, the emperor, empress can't do this on her own. She needs a, a committee, a community of wise people, a council that tell her when to do everything and follow their advice. And someone said, no, you can't wait for this consultation. Um, you need to con- consult the magicians and soothsayers. and They'll tell you what's coming, and then you'll know. And so there are all these answers. Um, the responses to the second question also lacked a certain accord, shall we say. One person said to the empress, you know, the question of who are the most important people to work with, um, to place all her trust in the advisors and administrators around her. Others said, no, 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 you should work with the physicians and the healers. And some said, no, the most important people to work with are the are your warriors. That's where you to put your faith in, into your, your military and so forth. And the third question drew another set of equally different answers. You know, what's the most important thing to do? And some said science was the most important. And others said it was based on religion. And others said, no, it was conflict resolution skills. Right, there you go. Or military skills, all kinds of answers. The empress was not pleased. We are not amused and we are not pleased. These answers didn't really satisfy her. So after some time of reflection, she resolved to visit an old wise woman who lived in the mountains, who was well known, a hermitess, I guess you would say, who lived in seclusion at the top of the mountain, as they do in these stories, right? (laughs) And was said to be wise, maybe even enlightened. Let's go find the enlightened woman up the mountain to see if she would be able to answer these three pressing questions. And she knew that this wise woman had lived in the mountains and was known to receive only the poor and refused to have anything to do with people of wealth or power. So the empress disguised herself as a simple peasant and ordered her attendants to come and wait at the foot of the mountain while she went alone. She got up to the dwelling of the old woman who nodded her head in greeting and was working in a small garden that obviously fed her and continued to dig. And the the empress said politely, I've come to ask your help with three questions and went through the three questions. What is the best time to do each thing? Who are the most important people to work with? What's the most important thing to do at all times? And the hermitess, the wise woman, she listened, but only patted the empress on the shoulder and continued digging. And the empress could see she was an old woman and said, you know, you must be tired. Here, let me give you a hand with that and picked up another hoe and spade and began to work. And they dug a few rows, and the empress stopped and repeated the three questions. And the wise woman didn't answer, but just kept digging. And finally, she said to the uh, empress, you've helped me, why don't you take a rest now for a moment? I'll continue. But the empress continued to dig. An hour passed and two, and the sun got ready to set. And the empress was kind of frustrated. I've asked. I'm here with the wise woman. No answer. Come on, baby. You know? I came here to ask you these three questions and ask one more time. I'm getting ready to leave. The old woman said, Wait, don't you hear someone over there coming? And the empress turned her head, and they both saw a man with a long white beard emerged from the woods, pressing his hands again, a big wound in his stomach. He'd obviously been 
attacked, he was just about unconscious. He fell at the feet of the empress, groaning. And opening the man's clothing, the empress saw this great gash and took off part of her own clothing and tried to stem the wound. And the wise woman went and got some medicinal herbs and they got water and they cleaned and spent a long time trying to wrap and bind and stop the bleeding and heal this person. And finally the wounded man regained consciousness and asked for water. And the empress ran down to the stream and brought back the fresh water. (sighs) The sun had disappeared and it was dark. And the wise woman gave the empress a hand and carrying the old man into the hut, he closed his eyes and they all lay down and fell asleep for the night. When the empress rose the next morning, the sun had already risen. And for a moment she forgot, now why had I come here? And as she was opening her eyes, the man who with a bandaged belly looked over her and said, please forgive me, please forgive me. And she said, but what, I've, what have I done that I should forgive you? He said, you don't know who I am, your majesty, but I know you. I was your sworn enemy. I would vowed to take vengeance on you because in the last years, your soldiers killed my brother and they took all our property. And when I learned that you were coming alone in the mountains to visit this old hermit, I resolved to surprise you on the way back and kill you. But after waiting a long time, there was no sign of you coming down the mountain, so I left my image to seek you out. And your soldiers saw me. They ran after me, and they took their swords out. I had intended to kill you, but they stabbed me instead, and I ran up here. And instead, you saved my life. Please forgive me. I'm ashamed of what I was thinking. And I am grateful to be your subject. And I will follow you now, for I see you as a a woman of great compassion. Please grant me your forgiveness. The empress was overjoyed to see that she had so easily reconciled with a man who'd been the enemy. And she not only forgave the man, but offered some land to return the property and to let her physician attend him. And she was, while she was doing this, she noticed that the old woman was outside working in the garden again, as the old women do. <coughs> they, have, they, they know how to plant the earth. So she went out and she said, I'm so frustrated. I mean, I'm happy to be here with you, but you haven't answered my questions. And the wise woman looked back and said, don't you see, your majesty, your questions have already been answered. How is that, she asked. Well, yesterday, if you'd not taken pity on my age and given me a hand with digging these beds, he would have been attacked by this man on the way down and perhaps killed. And you would have deeply regretted not staying with me. Therefore, the most important time was the time you were digging in the beds. And the most important person was myself. And the most important pursuit was to be of service and to help. Later, when the wounded man ran up here, the most important time was the time you spent cleaning and dressing his wounds. For if you'd not cared for him, he would have died and you would have lost the chance to be reconciled with him. Likewise, he was the most important person. And the most important pursuit was to be of service and help in that time. Remember, she went on, there's only one important time, and that's now. The present moment is the only time over which you have any dominion, over which you have any gift of power. And the most important person is always those you're with. For who's right before you, for who knows what will happen in the future and whether you'll have dealings with anyone else. But in this moment, those eyes, that body, that voice, that person is there with you. And the most important pursuit, the one that really tends your heart and makes your life meaningful and worthwhile, is to serve, to bring to that person and to those around you um, a happiness and a care 
for that alone is what life is for. And they lived happily ever after or something like that. Okay. So that's Thich Nhat Hanh and Tolstoy. Um, and it's really a story about the Bodhisattva. Again, thinking about meaning and Maladoma's phrase of delivering your cargo. Um, that our happiness comes when we have meaning in our life. To not be able to do something that uses your gift is really a, a, a great loss. And that meaning comes alive in relation to life itself and to one another. Whether you make art or whether you write or whether you tend other people or you tend a garden or your parent or something, if you can share your dignity, your generosity, your understanding, your integrity, your vision, and make that come alive within you and with others, um, your life becomes blessed. It becomes a source of happiness. And it's partly why we practice in some way to be able to be present enough that we can live in this way to bring ourselves to where we are. And the meaning of the bodhisattva, which is this compound word, bodhi means awaken and sattva is being, a being committed to the well-being and the awakening of all to hold all of life in compassion. So one more story for you. And this is a story about, uh, it's from the Christian Desert Fathers, nearly 2,000 years ago, in the deserts of Egypt and Sinai and so forth, mystics and meditators. Um, And uh, there was a great abbot of a, community or a a renowned wise man, an abbot, named Abbot Anastasius. Um, And one day a young man came and asked if he could join the order and be with the brothers who were part of that community. And he was welcomed in and given a little place to live and a robe and so forth. And the abbot had a most beautiful Bible that was all... Um, inscribed with gold leaf and exquisite calligraphy and so forth. Um, Very, very valuable. And it was used to read in their evening services. And the young man who was poor when he grew up saw it and coveted it, thinking that it was very valuable, which it was. And so one night, he made off with it. He took it and ran away to the city. Being in the city with this precious and valuable book, after some days, he went into the market and found the person who dealt with both books and antiquities and said, I have a really, really special book And I'd like to sell it to you to make money since he stole it. And the merchant said, ah, yes, please show it to me. So the young man brought out this gilded, gorgeous, bejeweled Bible, both the New and Old Testaments. And the merchant who knew about these things looked at it and said, leave it with me for a day or two and I will tell you what it's worth. The young man said, I'd like to get 18,000 for it. Some great number. Said, you leave it and I'll tell you. Two days later, the young man went back furtively and found the merchant and said, I've asked you for a great deal of money, but I believe it's a beautiful book. Will you not give it to me? And the merchant said, yes, I've discovered it is worth this much. And the young man said, how do you know that? He said, well, I went up in the hills to see my friend Abbot Anastasius, who knows about such things. And I showed him this beautiful book, and he said, oh, yes, it's very valuable, easily worth 18,000. And the young man said, did he say anything else? (laughs) And the merchant said, not another word. And the young man began to weep. And he said, oh, I've lost something really valuable. I need to return this book. And he went back and he 
dropped to his knees and wept and begged to the holy abbot and said, you know, I, I misunderstood what was really a treasure in this place. I took the wrong thing. Can, can I come back? And the abbot said, here, you can keep it if you like, if it means that much to you. And the young man said, no, no, I can't keep it. My life will never be the same if I keep it. Can I come back? And so he became a monk and lived in the monastery, and they lived happily ever after or something like that. Okay. And when I read this story, which I have at other times, um, there's something in it that has a kind of beauty to it. And it's really the beauty of integrity and the beauty of generosity. To, for Abbot Anastasia to not add to the suffering of this young man is a kind of remarkable act, isn't it? You know, and when you reflect on the things that happen and we lose things, things are taken from us, all those kind of things. It was that verse that I read from the Buddha. He robbed me, he beat me, you know. Stay with that and you live in misery. But it's not just the end of misery. Um, it's the level of integrity and of compassion to say, what, what, what would serve, what's good? Not the things that I have, but this other human being to see in that deep way, to see without judgment, to see with the heart. And it kind of brings a sense, as I listen to this story, of what does it mean to live from that kind of integrity. And we love it because we already know what it's like. You can feel it in yourself. Suppose you were to have done that, how that feels. Instead of being as we might be, judgmental or possessive or all those things, I heard a beautiful verse um, recently from one of the wonderful nuns that was teaching a retreat here, one of the Western nuns that comes from the early, you know, 2,600-year-old verses of the enlightened, the terigata of the enlightened elders of the women of the community. And the the verse was this, uh, it was a, a, a nun who said, talking about herself, my old faults, like snow falling on warm ground. And it's a beautiful kind of poetic line. There she was, and she could see all the judgments of how I was and how I was supposed to be. And my old faults falling like snow on warm ground and just melting away, not grasping, not picking up, not living from the place of judgment, but really living from the place of love. So this third story is, you could call it a story of compassion. You could call it a story of integrity. It is your integrity that really transforms the world around you, like it did, you know, with the old man and the Terry Dobson story. There's a passage from William Butler Yeats where he writes, We can make our minds so like still water that beings gather around us that they may see their own images and so live for a moment with a clearer, perhaps even a fiercer life because of our quiet. It's kind of an amazing passage that it's not that we're fixing others, but that we become so present with attention, with loving awareness, with love itself, that we become a kind of mirror or a space in which they can see themselves, um, mirrored without our, without judgment. And they learn something by our own depth and presence, by our integrity, by our own stillness. So when we sit and meditate, it's not just, okay, I can you know, release the tension in my body and stress reduction and stuff, which is a fine thing. We all need that too in these times, you know, or to work out some stuff. But it's really to come back to quiet the mind and tend the heart and remember what really matters to be able to live from that place of presence so that when life brings itself, brings the challenges that we all have, we can also be that mirror for others. We can carry that integrity. 
we can carry that compassion. And this is the invitation from the Buddha again. Live in joy and peace even among the troubled. Live in joy and health even among the afflicted. Live in joy and love even among those who hate. This is kind of fierce instruction in a way, but it is an instruction. Live in joy and peace even among the troubled. Make yourself that embodiment of peace. Live in health even among the afflicted. Live in joy and love even among those who hate. Become that which you would have the world become. Quiet your mind, tend the heart, free from fear and attachments. Know the sweet joy of living in the way. Now, how to do this? Meditation, yes. Understanding, also yes. This from the Buddhist text, the words from one conversation, the Buddha says, it seems as although we thought ourselves permanent, we are not. Although we thought ourselves settled, we are not. Although we thought we would last forever, we will not. It's tentative, baby. It really is. And it changes, and then you die, right? But before that, if you're lucky, you get old, you know? And there's a kind of... We live in a culture that likes to hide all that and have just young people on the covers of magazines. Like, you're always going to be like that. Good luck, you know? Um, how do we navigate the poem, the verse in the teaching says um, this life is like a star at dawn, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud an echo, a rainbow a phantom, a dream every day appears for you like it did for the empress and the old wise woman and so forth and it brings you new things to learn from to struggle with, to love, to engage in, and then they disappear. They leave a trace, if you will, in consciousness, but it's always changing, and it's always uncertain. What's going to happen tomorrow? Don't know. (laughs) Isn't that true? You know, what's going to happen? We don't know. So then how do we live in this wild uncertainty? star at dawn, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud. If we're really attached, me and mine and my things, if Abbotus Anastasia, my point of view, you know, again, Terry Dobson. (sighs) There is a vastness that you are a part of that is so beyond the small sense of self, and you know it. You know it at times when you make love, at times when, if you're lucky enough to, it's a wonderful thing. It is. It's pretty cool. (laughs) You know it, you know, looking out at the night stars on a long, dark night in the desert. You know it listening to an amazing piece of music or, you know, knowing at at the time of the birth of a child or sitting holding the hand of someone when they die. And the gates between the worlds open and you go, wow, what is this life? Is this going to happen to me? Yes, it is. You know, then what is it? What is it for? What is this mystery? And then there opens somehow in this vastness some sense that you're not just this body. You're not. Your body's changed. You were that little tiny baby body and a kid body and stuff. That's not you. It just isn't. You think you're made out of kale and burgers? I mean, it's just not your identity, right? You rent it, you get to use the body. But you were that spirit that was born into this body, 
that will also leave it. You'll see when it happens at the end. It's kind of a wild thing that happens. You get to inhabit it for a while. Um, but what does it mean then to rest in vastness, to remember that who you are is actually consciousness itself, the spirit that came into this body, your loving awareness, that's the way you are. And all this stuff happens in loving awareness. And you can begin to, in your meditation, you can begin to trust that the heart of loving awareness, which is compassion and understanding, is big enough to hold the whole dance. The joys and the sorrows, the gain and the loss, the pleasure and the pain, the the beauty of it, and the ocean of tears. You are larger than you think, way bigger, larger than you imagine. And then you become the old man in the the subway car. You become the wise woman in the mountain. You become the abbot who's unafraid to lose stuff because in the end, you know how it goes. It's like that very rich man who died and they were talking in the neighborhood, well, how much did he leave? And somebody else said, why, everything, of course. I mean, that's how it works, right? You know, that's the game, isn't it? But when you understand this, there comes a kind of freedom. The freedom comes when you sit in meditation and you can allow the whole range of emotions, the tears and the longing and the love and the tenderness and the fear and say, yes, all this can be held in the heart of compassion. And then you rise up, as it says in Zen, there's only two things you sit and you tend the garden, and you go and you tend the garden of the world, but you do it from a different place, from a place that's freer and less attached and less about me, because me is just temporary, you know, and more resting in that timeless awareness that is who you, who you really are. A poem and one more thing to do before we end. This is from Alison Luderman. called At the Corner Store. She's an Oakland poet and a friend of mine. It was a new old Arab man behind the counter, skinny, brown, and eager. He greeted me like I was his prodigal daughter, as if we both came from the same world, somewhere warmer and more gracious than this foggy city. I was thirsty and alone, sick at heart, grief-soiled, exiled from family through my own faulty temperament. Now there's a poetic line, exiled from family through my own faulty temperament. A little self-reflection there. (laughs) And his face lit up like I was his lost sheep wandering home, coming back to the freezer bins in front of the register, which were always filled with the same Starheart ice cream sandwiches and the dusty shelves with corn chips and, of course, the immortal Jim Beam. I shuffled to the register and bought my bottled water, and he returned my change, beaming like I was a bright new bud on the just bursting open cherry trees, like I was everything precious struggling to grow, and he was blessing me as he handed my change over the counter with its plastic tub of red licorice whips, five for a quarter. This old man who didn't speak English, beamed out love to me the iron week after my mother's death so that when I emerged from his store, my whole cockeyed life, wonderful failure, glowed like sunset after rain. I heard the city dogs yelping with passion in their yards and in the driveway across the street, a woman and a girl danced to contagious reggae. Praise Allah, the Buddha, Kuan Yin, Jesus, Mary, and old Jehovah, for the eyes and the hands of the Blessed One are everywhere. So these stories really talk about who you are in the deepest sense and what's possible for you and what's possible for us um, as human beings. For you are larger than you think 
and more noble. Um, and it satisfies you in a way that almost nothing else can. Oh, I have more stories and poems, but I think it's probably enough. Um, but you can reflect a little on these stories and where you find yourself and what they remind you of that's true. Alan Watts, the art of living is neither careless drifting on one hand nor fearful clinging on the other. It consists in being sensitive to each moment in regarding it as utterly new and unique in having the heart and mind open and truly receptive to this life that we're given. So let's sit for a little bit. You are consciousness itself, timeless, loving awareness, born into this body. You contain the great heart of compassion, the eyes of wisdom. These are your birthright. Let yourself sit quietly, let the mind quiet. Let the heart soften. And remember these gifts. They are your birthright. So I thank you for your kind attention. It's a sweet thing to just stop in a busy culture and listen to ourselves. So good night. Thank you.